The Hollow Man by T.S. Eliot We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw, alas. Our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless, as wind in dry grass, or rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom, remember us, if at all, not as lost, violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. Eyes I dare not meet in dreams, in death's dream kingdom, these do not appear. There the eyes are sunlight on a broken column. There is a tree swinging, and voices are in the winds singing, more distant and more solemn than a faded star. Let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom. Let me also wear such deliberate disguises, rat's coat, crow skin, crossed staves in a field, behaving as the wind behaves, no nearer. Not that final meeting in the Twilight Kingdom. This is the dead land, this is the cactus land. Here the stone images are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. It is like this in death's other kingdom, waking alone, at the hour when we are, trembling with tenderness, lips that would kiss, form prayers to broken stone. The eyes are not here, there are no eyes here, in this valley of dying stars, in this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. In this last of meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech, gathered on this beach of the Tumid River. Sightless, unless the eyes reappear as the perpetual star, multifoliate rose of death's twilight kingdom, the hope only of empty man. Here we go round the prickly pear prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom, between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. Life is very long, between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent falls the shadow, for thine is the kingdom, for thine is, life is, for thine is the, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang but a whimper. Hi, welcome to Lit Poetry. The Hollow Men is a poem associated with the modernist movement. Starting around 1870 in Europe, modernism lasted until about 1945. Modernism in general was a movement that is made up of various views and perspectives, but what all modernists had in common was concerns about the drastically changing society in, in which they lived. Society was becoming increasingly urban, industrial, less agricultural, and less tied down by tradition and religious moral frameworks. In response to the shifting 
cultural goalposts in society, modernists engineered new forms of expression that departed from older traditions in an attempt to address the emerging realities around them. T.S. Eliot was one writer who felt deeply alienated by modernity. He thereby tried to pioneer new poetic ways of writing that would express his growing sense of disorientation and disillusionment being experienced. In the 1920s, the poems he famously wrote, such as The Hollow Men and The Wasteland, seemed to be assembled as fragments, scraps of language that are loosely held together but read quite unpredictably. These fragments reflect on a society that was collapsing, falling into disrepair and confusion. As a modernist poem, The Hollow Men mirrors the broken, crumbling reality of Western culture, particularly after the bloodshed of the First World War and the gradual failure of its once strong value systems. Living in the shadow of World War I and left feeling adrift in a world that had lost confidence in its own cultural foundations and heritage, many members of Eliot's generation became hollow men ghostly, empty figures left to haunt the world in which they lived. Form, meter, and rhyme. The Hollow Men does not follow a standard form. Instead, the poem is written in free verse and broken up into five sections separated by numbers. It doesn't have a regular rhyme scheme or meter, and its stanzas vary in length some as short as two lines, some as long as ten. As such, the poem comes across as somewhat disorganised and chaotic. It never settles on a fixed pattern. Whenever it seems to, the poem morphs into something else. In a poem about fragmentation and trauma, this formal disorganisation reinforces the intended mood Eliot wanted in the first place. Poetic forms like the sonnet, which represent the legacy of the older European style, have no relevance here inside the modernist framework. The poem is fragmented and disorderly, just like the broken stone described in the poem itself. Furthermore, The Hollow Men makes no use of a rhyme scheme. It contains rhymes, yes, but not predictable, orderly ones. Indeed, the speaker only really makes use of partially failed rhymes called slant rhymes, such as between the words meaningless and grass in lines 7 and 8. These rather unsteady rhymes prod and probe at the reader's senses. Their erratic and unpredictable nature reinforce the state of decay and desolation that the poem is describing like the hollow men who seem unable to complete anything they start, who are gesture without motion, the poem's rhymes gather energy only to dissipate. The poem's rhymes are as fragmented and defeated as the hollow men are themselves. The speaker. The hollow men are portrayed as a group of exhausted, defeated, people of whom the speaker of the poem is a member. He describes the group members as being without substance. Their heads are literally filled with straw and in line 7 he points out that their voices are vacuous. They sow no empathy towards one another. Rather they flounder around blindly praying to broken stone, or in other words, to false gods and idols that can never bestow upon them a sense of purpose or meaning. Here, these hollow men and the speaker who is one of them can be interpreted as representing the generation that fought in and survived the war, emerging from it permanently scarred, unable to participate in or preserve their Western European culture, which seemed to be crumbling before their very eyes. It is interesting to note here, however, that another voice does actually make an appearance in the fifth section of the poem. The use of italics and the orientation of words on the right margin of the poem indicate the new voice's presence. This new voice is able to quote these other texts 
precisely, perhaps hinting that the being behind the voice, unlike the speaker himself, enjoys an intimate relationship with God and has a, has a much more fully formed sense of their own self. In contrast, the main speaker remains in his state of alienation and confusion. When he tries to repeat the quotes of the mysterious voice, he can only regurgitate fragments. For thine is the... It's as though the hollow men have ventured beyond redemption. Even in hearing the Bible, they can only cough up empty and lifeless fragments from its pages. Setting. The speaker describes the setting as some type of underworld or purgatory. The speaker refers to the place as Death's Dream Kingdom and Death's Twilight Kingdom. The location is consistently bleak and desolate, being compared to a desert. This is made clear when it is referred to as the Cactus Land. It is a haunting and hopeless place that the speaker also calls the Valley of Dying Stars. Such a beautiful phrase. It is full of ruins and damaged objects, broken stone and a broken column. These ruins serve as symbols of a failing and damaged European culture whose positive influence is clearly in decline. Poetic techniques. The Hollow Men is chock full of poetic devices, including metaphors, similes, repetition, consonants, assonance, alliteration, Sejura, enjambment, and much more. Too many to adequately unpack here. As such, I will focus on trying to talk about illusions. And that's because illusions really help to unlock some of the layered meaning in the poem. The Hollow Men is full of allusions to religious and literary texts, each allusion being very important. But before looking at them in isolation, it's important to think about their accumulative presence in the poem, piled one on top of the other. The poem can be read as a kind of literary trash heap, onto which scattered pieces of European literature are being swept. This connects to the poem's intent to demonstrate the demise of European culture, whose former glory has ended. With its mixed bag of quotations and allusions, the poem itself is an image of a culture in decline, whose masterpieces have been reduced to rubble and whose authority now lies in ruins. The allusions begin in the poem through the inclusion of two epigraphs that frame the reader's entry into the disturbing world of the poem. The first quote, Mr. Curtsy Dead, can be found in the novel Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Conrad's novel examines the story of Captain Kurtz, an ivory trader in colonial Africa who loses his sanity, moves into the heart of the jungle and sets himself up as a godlike figure ruling over a group of natives. The quote thus hints at some of Eliot's concerns regarding European decline. Captain Kurtz represents Eliot's greatest fear for his society that it will basically lose its former intellectual and moral moorings in life and end up adrift like Kurtz, dead, hollow, empty, and floating free on a meaningless sea. The second epigraph comes from Guy Fawkes Day, which occurs on the 5th of November. The Catholic revolutionary Fawkes in 1605 plotted to blow up the British Parliament and was arrested. As a tradition since the event, children would make effigies of Fawkes out of old clothes and sticks and filled with straw to be set alight on the 5th of November. Children would door knock neighbours saying, a penny for the old guy, to help buy what they needed. In the poem, of course, the straw effigies of Fawkes become an image of the hollow men themselves. Inhuman, ghastly creations that deserve to be consigned to the flames. The poem also contains allusions to key passages in Dante's Purgatory and Paradise. In these poems, when Dante encounters his great love, Beatrice, he cannot meet her gaze. She is an image of holiness and purity, so holy and so pure that Dante feels it would be disrespectful to even look at her. Through the allusion to Dante, the eyes thus become a symbol of God and God's holiness and of purity. The people who go to heaven have, the speaker notes, crossed with direct eyes. This will eventually become an important symbol in the poem. Eyes, 
come to be associated with God and God's power to observe and judge human life. With their direct eyes, the people going to heaven are closely linked with that power. They are able to look at things and judge their truth and their worth. As the poem progresses, it becomes obvious that the hollow men's eyes have lost their directness as they hide themselves away from truth and judgment. The mention of the Tumid River could also be interpreted as an allusion to the river Archeron, which surrounds Hal in Dante's Inferno. As for the fifth section of the poem, there is a direct allusion to the children's song, Here We Go Round the Mulberry Bush. The speaker, however, reframes the song to make it far more sinister and distorted. And finally, of course, there are multiple allusions to the book of Matthew in the New Testament in the quote, For thine is the kingdom. Themes. The loss of culture and emptiness. The poem begins in a very disturbing fashion by introducing us to the hollow men, fragmented, alienated and shadowy figures who struggle to live in the real world and instead abide in a wasteland. The speaker points out the hollow men's voices as dry to emphasise their barrenness of being. Their human voices, rather than being full of emotion and passion and sharp intellect, are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass. As such, the speaker is suggesting that the hollow men's voices roam senseless across the landscape like the wind itself, depressed and lonely, having lost their humanity. In their perpetual state of crisis, the hollow men have also become a danger not just to themselves, but to human society itself. In part two of the poem, the speaker describes them wearing a rat's coat and crow skin. These are symbols of disease and death, respectively, and they reinforce this idea that hollow men are dangerous to others. This does not mean that they are necessarily malevolent people, though. Rather, they are simply riddled with the disease and their condition is contagious. Their despair is like a virus that can spread throughout the community. And at the heart of the hollow men's problems are all the very difficult questions rising out of the horrors and inhumanity of World War I and the emergent idea that God is dead, as coined by Nietzsche, who famously argued that the idea of God was basically made redundant after the enlightenment of the 17th and 18th century and the emergence of scientific inquiry. Probably most disturbing of all, however, is that the poem implies that the hollow men's disease affects the environment in which they live as well. These men and their outlook, in other words, start to shape the physical world around them. For example, the landscape is described as a hollow valley and as a barren wasteland filled with cactus and dry grass and the whistling wind. For myself, I can't but help to think about the hollow men of today, ourselves, and how we ourselves shape the environment with our sometimes hollow values. This might sound rather depressing, but it's not that hard to argue that it is in our hollow and insatiable drive for consumption and more and more wealth in the modern world today that we find the true force of global warming and the destruction of our natural world in our meaninglessness and our reaching out to fill the void we then damage the environment too could it be that we are shaping the world into an image that simply reflects our own inner barrenness thank you